I have known uh, Professor David Capes for a number of years, and I'm delighted that he's able to be with us for this, I, I guess it's about our 50th Fall Hayward Lecture Series. So <clears throat> I didn't know that at the time we invited you, but I'll make a big deal out of it now, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Capes did his Ph.D. in 1990, finished it in 1990 at South, Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, for some of you, you'll be interested to know he did it. Uh, his supervisor was Earl Ellis, somebody who uh, was for many, many years a very distinguished New Testament scholar. And uh, he spent a couple of sabbatical leaves at the University of Edinburgh and, among other things, became very well acquainted with Larry Hurtado, who recently retired at Edinburgh. And if you know the discipline, you know that uh, Larry Hurtado is keenly interested in how it is the early church came to understand Jesus of Nazareth as, we might say, God in the flesh, the divinity, the recognition of the divine nature of Jesus. And this is a great uh, area of interest for uh, Dr. Capes, and it relates to the lectures that he will treat us to tonight, tomorrow, and Wednesday. There are several books that uh, he has published. I call your attention to a few of them, and several are listed in the brochure which you have. Uh, his dissertation was published in 92, Old Testament Yahweh Text and Paul's Christology. And that was the book that uh, really caught my attention and made me interested in Professor Capes' uh, work. Uh, I don't want to steal any of his thunder. He's going to be going into some of this in his lectures. But it's a very important topic. And uh, this was one of the reasons why I thought it would be good to have him come as a lecturer in the faculty. We talked about it, and the faculty agreed. Uh, also on the table is his Rediscovering Paul, an introduction to his world letters and theology. And I had a colleague uh, at Society of Biblical Literature describe it as about the best book you can get on Paul on that level that's recent. And uh, it was a ringing endorsement. It's, it's a book that would be good for everybody here, from people who have ac high academic interests and also people who are just getting their studies underway. Anyway, there are a few copies back there. He's also the uh, leading person involved in the voice Bible translation, and you'll hear more about that uh, over the next few days. He hosts, along with a couple of others, a radio program on Sunday nights, a show of faith. I've actually been on it uh, via the telephone. Uh, interesting, there's a rabbi and, uh, and a Roman Catholic priest and, and Dr. Capes. He's been at Houston Baptist University for 24 years. I guess he's beginning his 25th year. His wife's name is Kathy. They have three grown sons, ranging 27 to 33, and has just been mentioned, a 12-day-old grandson. Um, <clears throat> the lecture will go till about 8.30 or so. We're not real picky about that, but that's about when it'll go, when it will conclude. Uh, Curios as a Christological title. And then at about 8.30 when the lecture ends, there will be uh, some Q&A, and, and I'll monitor that, and uh, it will go for 15, 20 minutes. When that is finished, then uh, we will congregate outside, and there will be some refreshments. There will be opportunity for you to pick up some books, and uh, Dr. Capes can autograph some. I'll autograph a few others if you want. And... Uh, Anyway, we'll have a good time of uh, fellowship and conversation. So without any more uh, introduction, I want uh, Professor Capes to come forward and present to us tonight his first lecture. It is great to be with you. Thank you for the invitation. You probably can detect from my accent I'm not from these parts. Uh, I grew up in a place called Georgia, or as we say there, Georgia. It's often on my mind, as the song goes, but it's, uh, it's great to be with you here in Nova Scotia. I've heard so much about Acadia Divinity School through the years and the scholars that you've had here and, and the lecture series, so it's a delight for me and an honor for me to be here with you to share uh, this evening. And the topic is, is uh, it seems to me apropos, given the fact that when you look at the, the emblem of the university, uh, there's the cross, and then there's a Bible, then beneath that it says, in Greek, Iesus Kyrios, and I think that's Christos there. My eyes are not as good as they used to be, but Jesus 
And then on the other side, Christ or Messiah or as we've translated in the voice, the liberating king, the dynamic translation, and then the word kurios, most often translated Lord. So that's going to be my topic uh, for these lectures over the next few days, and this has been a great couple of days started. I uh, was contacted a, a many months ago by Craig, and, and Dr. Evans uh, has been so gracious. This has been, I host these kinds of things at my university. And I tell you, this has been so seamless and so perfect, all the people that I've dealt with. Uh, if there's been a hiccup, I haven't noticed. If there's been a glitch, it's passed me by. And so it is just a great delight for me to be with you. Now, uh, what I want to do over these next three, three, three days is to kind of build uh, a case for how we are to understand Jesus as the curios in Paul's letters. We're so accustomed to thinking of Jesus as Lord. We all, we all are our sons and daughters of the Nicene Creed and of, of the Chalcedonian Creed. We sing our hymns and such. But the way this developed, the, the claim that Jesus is Lord developed in a historical way. It's not just a dogmatic claim that we can make. It also developed in a historical way, a way that we can investigate, a way that we can explore, a way that we can consider. And so what I hope to do over the next uh, Few, few nights is to to sort of circle tonight and set the table and then my hope is <clears throat> that we'll go a little bit deeper tomorrow night and then sort of jump in all the way on Wednesday night and so here's uh, here's the plan first of all tonight curios has a Christological title what does it mean to call Jesus the curios when when Paul called him curios Lord what did he mean where did he get that title um how did that develop? We're going to be looking at that question tonight. And then secondly, uh, a topic that is near and dear to my heart, Yahweh text in Paul's Christology. I'll define what a Yahweh text is for you a little bit later on. Uh, but it's, it's, it's essentially a quotation of or an allusion to an Old Testament text containing the divine name, the unspeakable and effable name of God, and now applied to Jesus. I think that's a remarkable development. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Then finally, we're going to do a bit of exegesis and follow, track Paul's thinking. Think a few uh, lines behind Paul as he it, thinks through Scripture, as he engages Scripture, and I think builds a case for the divinity, the divinity of, of, of Christ. Now, but to start with this, I want to uh, begin with the English Bible tradition and the word Lord there, because that's how we're going to, that's how we're, most of us are going to continue to, to, to develop it and to think about, to think about that. Um, our title um, in the English Bible, two main ways, you'll see it, Old Testament, New Testament. Number one, it's employed to designate a person. Now, this is always a lowercase Lord, lowercase L, always employed to, impl uh, to talk about a person of superior status, elevated status, who's an owner, who has certain dignity, certain power, certain authority, certain influence. We see that over and over. And then in its capitalized form, there's two ways you'll see this. Lord with the initial capital and Lord with all capitals are employed with reference to God, to, to Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Now this primarily is in the Old Testament, and we'll show you some examples of that as we move through. Let me give you a few examples in the Old Testament. Some words, some Aramaic and Hebrew words that end up uh, sort of folding into our understanding. So Isaac blessed his son Jacob, Yaakov, and said, Be Lord, Gavir, over your brothers. This is the first word. It's not commonly used. Be Lord over your brothers, and may your mother's sons bow down to you. So the Hebrew word Lord, translated Lord, refers here to the head of a family. And by extension, later on, the head of, head of a, a people, a head of a larger group, not just a family, but a large people group. We see another word, the word Adonai in the Hebrew Bible, used of patriarchs, used of Joseph as the vicegerent, of Moses, of foreign kings with all sorts of names, with notable leaders like Ezra, a little bit later in the, in the text. And then Lord translates, uh, again, lowercase, the word Adonai to refer to the Israel's kings, Solomon and David, and uh, I, I guess pretty much most of the kings, 
Very often the Davidic kings are given this sort of my Lord the king title very often. And then we have the prophets of Israel that are there as well, who can sometimes, because they are speaking for God, be described as Lord as well. And then we have the, the special case where the word Lord translates, again, the word Adonai in Hebrew. God, always uppercase, and then the messengers, angels, because they represent God again, they are often described as my Lord. In the book of Zechariah, uh, there's an angelic guide, and Zechariah turns to him and speaks to him and says, my Lord. So this is very common. Well, I think the most significant use, though, of the word Lord, and notice it's all capitals in the English Bible tradition, is when it, Lord translates the unspeakable, ineffable name of God, the name protected by the commandments. The Yod, the He, the Vav, the He. We don't know exactly how it's pronounced, but more often than not, people today will say something like Yahweh. That could be right. That it could be Yahweh or Yahweh. We don't really know. Now, I've given you here a couple of different representations of the divine name. The top two are a kind of a Paleo-Hebrew text. And then the bottom one is more of an Aramaic or a square script. Now, on our third night, we're going to be looking at some Dead Sea Scroll manuscripts, and we're going to see some interesting things that happen in making biblical manuscripts and how the name of God is written and what happened when the name was God was written and what the rabbi said, what happens when we make a mistake writing the name of God? What are we to do? And they debated these things back and forth. And we'll look at a few examples of that. But notice that the, that, that the word Lord in the English Bible all capitals translates the divine name 6,800 times. That's a remarkable number of references here uh, to the one true God. Now, the majority of English translations are going to give us something like, like this. Yahweh rendered Lord, all capitals, starting with the King James Version. But on seven occasions, the King James transliterates the word the tetragrammaton, the four letters, as we often refer to it, as Jehovah. You've probably heard that. I grew up hearing that name a great deal, and perhaps you did too as well. I am Jehovah. That is my name. Let me share with you a couple of texts that I think might be of interest to you as we, as we move through this. And part of this might be a reminder for us who have been reading the Bible a long time. Here in the book of Exodus, chapter 6, verse 3, the King James. And I appeared to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob by the name God Almighty, El Shaddai. But by my name, Jehovah, I was not known unto them. The passage relates here the initial meeting of Moses and Yahweh at the burning bush when God commissioned Moses and revealed his covenant name. Back there in Exodus 3 and, and other places. Now, you also see that name Jehovah with certain place names. Jehovah Jireh, for example, in Genesis 22. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Now, maybe you heard another translation, it shall be provided. Well, actually, probably the better translation, the better rendering is the King James. I think the King James got it right here. It says, it shall be seen. And I, the reason I say that is because if you take a look at, the, um, at the, the Septuagint, that's exactly how it ends, that kurios opte, the Lord has been seen at that point. So here is the word Jehovah and its translation. Here's some other ways the divine name is translated. In modern translation, Jerusalem Bible uses the word Yahweh. Other translations like the New Living and the Holman Christian Standard Bible use Yahweh in special occasions, but most of the time it's the word Lord. And then there's the word Jehovah in Young's Literal, the New World, then the word Adonai in the complete Jewish Bible. Then what we did in the voice is we, and also we went back and saw Moffat's translation, we decided to take the meaning of the name, I am that I am. God is the one who was, who is, and is to come. And we translated the name the eternal. So he trans tried to translate the meaning behind the name, not just the sound of the name itself. 
But the majority of, of, of texts out there are continuing to render the word, the divine name, the unspeakable name of God, by the word Lord. There are a lot of phrases, interesting phrases, the angel of Yahweh we could talk about and we'll need to talk about when we talk about Jesus and the appropriation of the Yahweh text to Jesus. And then there's the phrase, the day of the Yahweh, as we see in the book of Amos and other places, the day of judgment. Particularly before the exile, it was a day that they said, oh, oh don't, don't ask for the day of Yahweh. When it comes, it's going to be, you're not going to fare very well. Even God's people were not going to fare well. But after the exile, it's interesting, the day of Yahweh seems to take on a different side, different feeling. Yes, God's judgment it will come, but it will come against our enemies. And we ourselves will be rescued. We will be saved. Our exile will be over at that point. And, and then, of course, there's that wonderful phrase, Yahweh Sabaoth, often translated Lord of hosts. About 240 times we see that in the Hebrew Bible. It's not equally dispersed, but it's, it's nevertheless there. And then we see the phrase that is common in the Psalms that we use even today in our worship in Baptist churches and Anglican churches and Catholic churches, the phrase hallelujah, praise be to Yah, a shortened version of the divine name. In Aramaic portions of the Bible, we see, uh, and here's just an example, um, in Daniel chapter 2, the English word Lord translates the Aramaic mare. Now that's going to become important because in the New Testament, there's a, there's a, a, a little prayer wish that Paul gives us at the very end of the book of 1 Corinthians. And we know that is Maranatha. Our Lord come. And it is either a prayer for the second coming of Jesus or an appeal to Jesus to be present with them when they gather to worship. We can't really say for certain. But it's clear in Paul's thinking that it's directed to Jesus. A prayer directed to Jesus. Well, let's see. That didn't... That didn't proceed. Also, the same Aramaic word is used to refer, same Aramaic word, to King Nebuchadnezzar in certain phrases there relating to the king. So we come to the New Testament. The New Testament, the English word Lord, lowercase, or Lord, uppercase, translates two Greek words. The Greek word despotes, despot, you see that there. And then also that Greek word kurios. That's going to be my focus here. Now, when we see that, and I'll just give you an, an example here. Um, the Greek word despotes is rendered in some versions, Lord, some versions, it's, it's, it's master when referring to slave owners. But it can also be used as a prayerful address to God and also to Jesus the sovereign. So it's not just referring to uh, lower level or human lords. It's also referring to the divine Lord. Now, the most significant Greek word translated Lord is the word kurios. And so that's really what I want to focus on. Like the Hebrew word Adonai, the Greek word kurios is employed for divine and also human reference. Now, in Greco-Roman antiquity, there were four ways this particular word was used. And all of these become significant. Sometimes the word kyrie, my Lord, could just be a polite address from a lesser to a superior. If you watch Downton Abbey, you see that, right? Anybody Downton Abbey fans here? Yes, several. Anytime, oh, the old English way, my Lord, from an inferior to a superior. Now, I realize that's not politically correct, but that's the way the word was particularly used. It was also used for masters and, and, and those who um, owned property or owned businesses or owned things or owned people, slave owners, for example. It was used in reference to divine rulers, Caesars, the imperial cult and such. We'll have more to say about that tomorrow night. And then it was also used to reference gods and goddesses, gods like Serapis, Isis, Osiris, uh, Dionysius, Zeus, the word kyrios was referred to these particular, uh, to these particular uh, divine beings in the Greco-Roman context. Now in the Septuagint, which I think is more apropos and more important for our use here, kyrios designates, once again, people who possess some sort of authority, a head of a family. And so in many cases, kyrios translates words like givir, Adonai as well. 
Owners of livestock, masters of slaves, and kings. But kurios, and this is where I want to sort of dig down a little bit, also translates Hebrew words for God. A word like Adonai. A word like Elohim. Well, isn't that translated theos? Well, usually yes, but not always is it translated that way. And I want to focus upon this notion that, that kurios is used to translate the tetragrammaton, the four letters, the yod, the he, the vav, the he, of the unspeakable name of God, more than 6,000 times in the Septuagint, or the Greek version of the Hebrew Bible. Because you remember, Paul is writing in Greek, and he's writing to his churches in Greek. And so when he quotes the Old Testament, he quotes the Old Testament not in Hebrew, he quotes it in Greek. And we'll be looking at several of those specific quotations uh, tomorrow evening in particular. I think Paul's use of kurios for Jesus may be the most significant. And we see here that in certain occasions in the Gospels, Jesus is referred to as my Lord. Now, that, that forms a special case that I want to sort of describe here. In the New Testament, it's not uncommon in the Gospels for Jesus to be described as Kyrie, my Lord. What's interesting is that there's no sense of divinity necessarily in that use. It's only regard for him as a rabbi or as a teacher. What's interesting to note is that the opponents never call Jesus Kyrios. They call him teacher. They call him rabbi. I think this is because the, in the Gospels, the word has not yet taken on full transcendent significance. But it is becoming that. And it is hinting toward that. It is leaning in that direction. Particularly because, uh, to some degree, a lot of the work that Paul and others have done. Now, one of the key texts is this right here. Psalm 110. The Lord, notice all capitals, Yahweh, said to my Lord, Adonai the King, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. This is a key text in the New Testament. That Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. That Jesus has been exalted in the resurrection. Seated at the right hand of God. And you'll notice the Lord said to my Lord. In English, it's the same word. It sounds a little strange. In the Hebrew, it's not as strange. It's not as hard to see. But there's almost a play on words here that the gospel writers take advantage of. And it seems to me that this is going to be a very important text, a key text. Sit at my right hand, God says, to his Lord, the king, until I put your enemies under your feet. Well, this, this clearly is an important text because it's picked up in Acts, it's picked up in Peter, it's picked up in Paul, it's picked up in Ephesians, it's picked up in a variety of places. That idea, sit at my right hand. He is seated at the right hand of God. Sometimes it's a full quotation, sometimes it's just an allusion to, what's, to what's, uh, what's happening there. So now Paul employs kurios most frequently as a, as a honorific. That's a kind of title, an honorific title. For Jesus, the confession, Jesus Christ is Lord and the belief in the resurrection is key. It's the center of his gospel. And Paul describes it in a number of places. We'll look at it in 1 Corinthians 8, 6. We'll see it also in Romans 10 and we'll see it uh, in Philippians 2, 5 through 11, particularly 9 through 11, where that part of the hymn celebrates the exaltation of Jesus who's been given the name above every name so that when his name is spoken every knee will bow in heaven on earth and below and every tongue will confess Jesus the liberating king the Messiah is Lord all to the glory of God the Father this is how that magnificent early Christian hymn uh, concludes there in Paul's letter well, one of the key questions, and this is where I want to spend a little time with you this evening, is one of the key questions is, how did this happen? How did this word kurios become associated with Jesus? What was the sort of backdrop? We're so accustomed to it. It rolls off the tongue so easily. But for Paul and for the earliest Christians, there had to be a moment of revelation. There had to be a moment of aha 
in which they said, it is appropriate to speak of Jesus in this way. Now, we've looked at the landscape of how various Hebrew and Greek words were translated, Lord, Lord, and Lord, the different capitalizations and such. I think it's important now to see why kurios specifically becomes a Christological title. I hinted earlier at the rough edge of a debate that's been going on among scholars regarding how the title was appropriated to Jesus and what the devout would have meant when they said it and when they used it. And I want to look a little bit deeper into that question in what time that remains. Paul's use of kurios as a Christological title has been the subject of an ongoing debate throughout the, the 20th century, if not before. I think it started before. On the one hand, there are those who say, well, the, it's the Greco-Roman setting that is the most important. That's what determines Paul's use of kurios. Others say, no, it's probably more likely the Jewish setting, the Jewish background. Jewish influences are what are determinative in this particular case. Now, that may be a little bit of a simplification, but I think that's really a, a part of, of the broader debate of what, 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 early, what the Christian studies have been a part of, and, and particularly with what's known as the history of religion school in Germany. It started in Germany. Uh, the center of that was Göttingen, and its key scholar was a fellow named Wilhelm Busset. We'll say more about him in a minute. And so there's the history of religion school that was saying that the, the key behind understanding what it means to call Jesus Lord is really due to what was happening in the Greco-Roman and pagan society because there were gods aplenty, there were lords aplenty, there were emperors who were divine aplenty. And so to call Jesus Lord was, was not a big deal at all. It was just adding one more god to the pantheon. That's how some have taken it. But there is a new history of religion school, at least according to Martin Hingle, the late great Martin Hingle, he stated that on the back of a book, in a blurb to a book by Larry Hurtado, we mentioned earlier, One God, One Lord, he said that Larry is sort of the architect of a new history of religions movement. That the Kyrios title is really related more to the Jewish side of things. It's more determinative. And we'll be looking at that. Now that's, the ma that's a major question, confronting what it means to call Jesus. Where did it come from? How did it get started? Historically, we might confess it today over and over, but do we know where it came from? Do we know what it meant? Do we know what funded it in the very beginning? And what I'm trying to do is to share with you how it came to be. There have been three options suggested. Wilhelm Busset's book, that's a, a great book. We'll say more about that in just a moment. Three options have been suggested. Now, some scholars accept the idea that the earliest Christians who spoke Aramaic in Palestine were the first person to say that Jesus is Kyrios or Mare in the full sense of divinity. But there are others assuming that that kind of acclamation could not be made. You could not say Jesus is Lord in a divine sense among monotheists because there already was a God. God the Father, as Jesus, as, as Paul himself writes, one God, the Father. So Jewish monotheism would have precluded, but it kept that from happening. And then others kind of march a fine line, saying, well, the, the, what really happens is that Jesus is called Kurios, yes, in the Palestinian church, but they didn't mean divinity by it. They meant he was, he was above them. He was superior to them. He was their master. He was their teacher. He was their rabbi. And only later, when the Christian movement sort of left behind Judaism and Jewish roots, did, was that ever even possible? The term kurios meant something different to those Jewish believers, those first believers, according to this theory, than it did to later Gentile believers who composed Paul's churches. For Palestinian Christians, Jewish Christians, Jesus would be kurios one day when he returned. For diaspora Christians, Jesus was the exalted Kyrios, who now reigns at the right hand of God. It was for Gentile Christians that when Jesus was called the Kyrios, it meant Lord in the fullest sense of divinity. Now I want to look at, at Wilhelm Busset, who was described as the brightest star. This is uh, William Baird's assessment. The brightest star in the galaxy of the history of religion school. Let me give you a little background to Wilhelm Busset. 
Last year, 2013, marked the 100th anniversary of the publication of this book in German. His greatest work, probably. Curios Christos, Geschichte des Christus Glauben von den Anfangen des Christentums bis Irenaeus. Uh, Curios Christ, the history of Christ's devotion from the beginning, its earliest beginnings of Christianity to Irenaeus. Now, the original German edition was published in 1913, 100 years ago, plus a year. A revised edition came about in 1921, a year after Bouhet Bousset died of a heart attack. He was only 54 years old. The First World War was very tough on him, not because he was a combatant, but because there was just, he, he nearly uh, couldn't get, he couldn't, he was cold, he was wet, he was, uh, he, he just had no food, he near, nearly died. It was not until 1970, though, that this particular book was published and translated into English. Think about that. By then, it had gone through six German editions. The fifth carries an introductory word by Rudolf Bultmann, no less. And in 2013, Baylor University Press published a new edition of Curios Christos in English with a new introduction. Now, I think the importance of the book, Curios Christos, is evident in that brief bit of history. Few books in religious studies, we're talking about Arthur Conan Doyle a little bit earlier, yes, no doubt, he probably, uh, his books were published over, but in religious studies, for a book to be published 100 years later and be translated to another language 60 years later is pretty remarkable. So Bousset and his colleagues in the History of Religion School sought to understand the rise of Christianity, not as a dogmatic, not as, not as what they believed, but primarily from a historical phenomenon. And rather than saying, well, we've got to just stick to the New Testament, what they said is, let's look at all early Christian literature. And rather than privileging Christianity, this was another thing they did, they sought to locate Christianity within the range of other uh, uh, religions and religious options in the Mediterranean world. Now, one of the major contributions that Bousset had was his desire to explain how you explain the rise of religious devotion to Jesus. If Christ's devotion is not the most remarkable feature of early Christianity. I don't know what it is. When you think about it, something that we take for granted, but something which these people did not. For them, it was extremely significant when they first began praying in Jesus' name, composing hymns in his name, gathering in his name, passing judgment in his name. To do so, about a man who they recently knew and who eyewitnesses could tell them about. They knew the manner of his walk. They could remember the sound of his voice. It's a pretty remarkable thing to think about. Now these folks believe and think and hold that Jesus is curios in the fullest sense divinity. Now a lot of modern scholars applaud Bousset, but they do so cautiously because his reconstruction of second temple Judaism has not stood the test of time. Now, as a result, his analysis of the relationship between Judaism and Christianity, the two religions, has proven more false than true. Now, the reason for that is the discovery of many things like the Dead Sea Scrolls and dozens of pseudepigrapha and other Jewish texts and other reassessments of the data has led scholars to a new kind of thinking in regard to what Judaism was like in the first century. Scholars like Ed Sanders, W.D. Davies, N.T. Wright, some of your own scholars like Craig Evans, have participated in that as well. Like many of his contemporaries, Bousset had a very dim view of spate Judentum, late Judaism. According to them, the Jewish religion, religion had reached its peak with the ethical monotheism of the writing prophets, but it gradually had run out of steam on its own. Ironically, it was when they were in exile in Babylon that they began rubbing shoulders with the, Jew, with the Jewish religion, with the Iranian religion, that in fact, new life sparked into it for a while. According to Bousset, the title Kurios is applied to Jesus. It's not in a Jewish context, but in the Greek-speaking churches outside of Palestine. This new title displays earlier terms, of low Christology, like Son of Man and Christ and such, which were understood by them simply as human titles. And Kyrios became the new title of the Hellenistic churches, 
when they had to translate this religion into a new paradigm. That is the religion, according to Bousset, that Paul inherited and that Paul used. Now, the original Christian communities with their eschatological son of man figure emphasized the future of the church when the Messiah would return to restore all things. And as the movement grew and moved beyond Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth, it came into contact with Gentiles. It took on a decidedly Gentile flavor. Rather than emphasizing the future consummation, Gentile Christianity stressed the present experience of the risen Lord when they gathered together to worship and they had baptisms and they had lively celebrations of the Lord's Supper and, and love feasts and miraculous works were being done and inspired utterances by prophets were being given. That convinced the Gentile Christ followers, Christ believers, that they were experiencing the presence of the risen Lord. He was alive and he was with them. That is the context, Bousset said, in which kurios becomes a proper title, a divine title for Jesus. Bousset concluded that Hellenistic Christianity originated and flourished in Syria, far away geographically and culturally from the Palestinian roots of Jesus in the early church. And this is how he framed it, his, his words now. I think I might have this coming up. No one thought this out. That is the, the, the application of the title kurios to Jesus. No one thought this out. No theologian created it. People did not read it out of the sacred book. Notice, it has nothing to do with the Old Testament. They would hardly have dared without further ado to make such a direct transferal of the holy name of the Almighty God, almost a deification of Jesus. Such proceedings take place in the unconscious, in the uncontrollable depths of the group psyche of a community. This is self-evident. It lay, as it were, in the air. But the first Hellenistic Christian communities gave the title Kyrios to their cult hero. I'm not sure if the word Kyrios came across there. Yes, it came across. The right font is there. Interestingly, Blueset considered this an explosive move. But it was an unintentional. They didn't think it out. They didn't do. It was a totally unreflective response based upon the church's wonderful religious experiences. Since this took place far from its Jewish roots, it could have nothing to do with a rereading of the sacred scriptures. It could have nothing to do with a reassessment of Jewish tradition. Despite the distance of it, geographically, culturally, Bousset does not believe anyone would have dared transfer the name of the Almighty God to Jesus. That would have amounted, according to Bousset, to almost actually a deification of Jesus, his words. Now, to that I say precisely. Bousset understood, though he certainly denied, the implications of applying to Jesus the unspeakable name of God, the one true God in a Palestinian setting. Now, there are two reasons for this. Uh, behind the theory of this extra-Palestinian origin. One is, is, is this, the monotheistic heritage of the first Palestinian Jesus followers would have prevented them assigning to Jesus, a man of recent memory, such an exalted status. Again, Bousset's words. Now, it becomes clear it was no accident. We did not encounter the title Kyrios on Palestinian soil in the gospel tradition. It's interesting, he pr privileges the gospel tradition to what is actually earlier, the Pauline tradition. Such a development would not have been possible there. The placing of Jesus at the center of the cult of a believing community, this particular doubling of the object of worship, is conceivable only in an environment in which the Old Testament monotheism is no longer considered valid. So Jesus could have been acclaimed as Lord only outside of a Palestinian context. Now, the second thing he does is he refers to the fact that philologically in the material evidence in Greco-Roman culture, and it's well known, that the word kyrios was available to be used for, for gods, various gods. We've already named some of those gods, but we could add other names. But also rulers, beginning with Caesar Augustus, who was called God and Lord Caesar Theos, Kaikurios, Kaiser, Kaiser Autokrator. God and Lord Caesar Almighty, as it were, or most powerful. Epictetus refers to Caesar as Lord of all, Kyrios, Panton. Like other texts, many other texts demonstrate clearly that during this period when Christianity is just getting started and just getting moving, that 
rulers are acclaimed and being acclaimed as Lord, particularly in the eastern part of the empire. So is that the point? Is that the purpose? Is that how it started? Not only did faithful citizens of Rome and other empires utilize the curios predicate and adoration of their rulers, they also applied it freely to the gods of the mystery religions and such. Now, based on all of this, Bousset argues that Hellenistic culture, with its emperor cults and gods and goddesses, provided the kind of setting which it became not only possible, but popular to invoke Jesus as curios and make him the central figure of the cult of early Christianity. I'm using the word cult not in a negative way here, a pejorative way, but in a sociology of religion sense, as the, 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 the official center of the religion. So curios was applied to Jesus first within and only within the environment of the diaspora churches where there were gods aplenty to be worshipped and reverenced and served. Now the legacy of Bousset is, is pretty significant and important. And... Um, I love some of these images from Greco-Roman culture. We'll skip through those. One, one of the people that took him uh, very seriously was Ferdinand Hahn. And uh, you'll see that Bousset separated Paul from Jesus pretty significantly. You have Jesus and then Jesus' influence on the Palestinian Jewish church. And then it evolved to the Hellenistic Greek church. And then finally that is what influenced and touched Paul's life. Han said, no, it's more complicated than that. He put another step between the two. There was Jesus, who had his influence upon the Palestinian Jewish church, and then there was the Hellenistic Jewish church, and then there was the Hellenistic Greek church, and that's what Paul came in contact with, and that's who led Paul to faith, and that's how Paul began to view and to think about the Christian faith. Well, there are a lot of reactions to to Bousset, uh, you, you might imagine uh, kind of where, where this could have gone almost immediately. There were scholars like J. Gresham Machen, you've probably heard of him in another generation, who, who began uh, arguing that uh, in his book, The Origin of Paul's Religion, that the supremacy of Greco-Roman influences uh, should be, should, should, that should not be taken seriously. And he upheld instead the Jewishness as the determinative factor in the formation of Paul's religion. A.E.J. Rawlinson, too, asked these two questions, pertinent question, to what extent did Paul, the apostle to the Gentile, remain a Jew? Was he a self-conscious Jew, or had he left that behind? And to what extent did he succumb to the syncretistic practices of the day? And to what extent would Paul, we might add, the one who came from a Jewish tradition that hated and mocked idolatry, begin to adopt in a sense, a type of idolatry and doubling uh, the idea of God, as Bousset had suggested. And so here, here is some of the things that Rawlinson noted uh, along the way. Um, he noted that in Paul's letters, well, here's his statement. I love this statement. Christianity is simply Judaism with its center of gravity shifted in consequence of the new era. That's, that's the way he said we should look at Judaism. Uh, early Christianity as coming out of, of Judaism. Uh, as Alan Siegel says, it, Rebecca's children, you have rabbinic Judaism born out of Second Temple Judaism, but you also have early Christianity, uh, two children in the same womb, uh, in a sense. And he noted the fact that, that Paul, over and over and over, says the gospel of, of Jesus is to the Jew first and then also to the Greek. And then he, he quoted from the Old Testament very frequently. And he spoke with pride concerning his Jewish heritage. You remember that in Philippians 3, right? How Paul seems to celebrate his Jewish background. And he gives a very impressive resume about who he was. And yet he said, despite all of that, I've suffered the loss of all things. Despite all that, I'm, I'm pressing forward uh, to become more like Christ. Paul doesn't seem to have a lot of knowledge of Greek philosophy, Greek literature. Uh, there's some quotations, perhaps, in the book of Acts, but in Paul's letters themselves. And here, clearly, Paul considered idolatry shameful and something to be mocked and something not to be considered. So the question, given all this, Rollins says, would Paul have been so eager to borrow the central ideas of his faith and his confession from pagans? Would that be what Paul was up to at the time? Now, ultimately, 
Um, Rawlinson said, and we'll look at this passage a little bit more later, uh, later is, uh, he said that it was the Maranatha invocation, 1 Corinthians 16, 22, where Paul concludes his letter with the Maranatha, our Lord come, addressed to Jesus. He said that is the Achilles heel of Bousset's theory. He said it might be a good theory, but there's the weakest point is that confession, that early Christian confession, that Paul quotes from Aramaic to Gentile churches. Suggesting, of course, like we would say hallelujah or Abba, you know what that means, I know it, because we have translated that and transferred that to the new church. The, the new church. Paul had done the same thing, or earlier, even before Paul became a, a Christ follower. The, the church was all, already using Maranatha and saying that and, and it didn't need to be explained and it did not need um, it did not need to be defended they knew what it meant to say Maranatha Jesus so this uh, some other scholars post Holocaust it's interesting to see what happens after the Holocaust it in the shadow of the Holocaust and in the light of the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, a lot of things began to happen to the orthodoxy of the uh, history of religion school. Uh, perhaps nobody did more than W.D. Davies in his book, his sea change book, Paul and Rabbinic Judaism, to, um, to give us sort of a new, a new way of thinking about this. And this is his quote that I want to show you. There was considerable, uh, all of his research suggested that there was reciprocal interchange of thought between Judaism in Palestine and the Judaism in the diaspora. So, so that the idea that there was some watertight compartment of, of Judaism here and Judaism there had to be abandoned. And then, of course, there is the great Martin Hingle, uh, who carried out probably the most exhaustive study of the evidence of Judaism and Hellenism in the ancient world. He concluded that the Hellenization of Palestine, which had begun in the upper classes not long after the time of Alexander the Great, had made its way into the general population in the next two centuries. He cited as evidence the fact that in the Talmud there are Greek loan words. He cited the use of Greek names in Palestine. The erection of the gymnasium Jerusalem of the high priest uh, Jason and two Maccabees, along with the education that had to have gone with it. The writing of Jewish literature and history in Greek and tombstone inscriptions discovered written in both Greek and Aramaic in the same, the same time, the same place. According to Hingle, this usual distinction between Palestinian Judaism and Hellenistic Judaism, he said, must be abandoned. And here's his statement. From about the middle of the 3rd century B.C., all Judaism, all Judaism that we know, must be designated in the strictest sense, Hellenistic Judaism. N.T. Wright credits Hingle for, and this is his quote, the dawning scholarly awareness that the Jewish world of the first century was itself Hellenized through and through, so that to do what some earlier generations had done and go looking for a pre-Hellenistic, a non-Hellenistic strand of primitive Jewish Christianity was to search blindly in a dark room for a black cat that wasn't there in the first place. <laughs> Only Wright could say something like that. He proposes that the prevailing orthodoxy of the environment insisted that a high Christology, a Christology that associates Jesus with the divine name, had to be late. How late was it? Well, Dan Brown, <laughs> you know, 4th century, maybe Jimmy Dunn, late, late 80s, late 90s. How late? It had to be late. And if it was late, we don't have to take it seriously because it had nothing to do with the real Jesus of history. We really want to know something about the real Jesus of history. Regarding the current question, the source of the Christological use of Kyrios, Wright claims early Christians did not borrow it from paganism. Instead, they derived it from the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. The Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible where the name of God over 6,000 times is translated Kyrios. 
Larry Hurtado, retired professor of uh, New Testament, as you mentioned, University of Edinburgh, is often credited with having founded this new history of religion school. Martin Hingle himself made the claim on the back of his book, One God, One Lord. More than any other scholar that I know, Hurtado has taken boost to task and written kind of an alternative story, an account, for how religious devotion, full religious devotion, could be applied and understood to Jesus from, from the time of, of Jesus to Irenaeus. Hurtado argues that, that given Paul's Jewish background, including his own dismissive attitude toward paganism and idolatry, we should regard the Jewish religious use of kurios more determinative for Paul's Christological use than any other source. So the proper origin of the confession, Jesus Kyrios, Jesus is Lord, ought to be sought in Jewish circles. Two features, he said, are relevant. Number one, how Greek-speaking Jews used Kyrios and how Kyrios is used in translating the Hebrew and the Aramaic text referring originally to the one true God. So we're kind of back where we started this evening. The semantic range of kurios and related words in the Hebrew Bible and New Testament. Words like Gevir, Adonai, Despotes, Kyrios, and the divine name itself. It's my contention, following my own doctor father, Earl Ellis, and other scholars like Hurtado, Bauckham Wright, and some others, that if we were to understand what early Christians meant, like, like, like Paul, when they said Jesus is Kyrios, we have to engage in a close contextual reading of Paul's letters, vis-a-vis -vis the Septuagint itself. This kind of dialectical approach will take Paul's word, Paul at his word, that he is a Hebrew of the Hebrews and that he is a Jew. In particular, our lecture tomorrow will focus and introduce us to the remarkable features in Paul's letter. First, his willingness to invest Jesus with the divine name, the name above every name. And second, his propensity to read Old Testament text containing the divine name and say that is about Jesus. Thank you. Look forward to your questions. Well, that was crystal clear. And uh, that lecture hour just flew by. I don't know about you, but I couldn't believe it. I is that right? Okay. Watch. <laughs> Uh, what happened here? <laughs> anyway, very good. Let's have some uh, questions. Uh, remember, uh, just a question. Keep it, uh, keep it brief and keep it direct. No speeches. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, be very interested in hearing your comments and your yeah. questions. Yes, Headley, please. Uh, and here comes a microphone right over your shoulder. Yeah, the microphone too. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. That was very helpful. Thank you. Um, what I'm understanding then is that the early church in its experience of Jesus came to the conclusion that he was divine and then looked for terms to express that in Greek or in the local well, language? Yeah, a, a part of the question that I hope to explore in the next couple of lectures is how that comes about. I do think powerful religious experiences, their experience of the risen Jesus, had much to do with that, but I also think it, it was a critical sort of rereading of texts that brought them to that conclusion as well. It wasn't sort of one or the other. I don't think that they found that Jesus to be divine and then went looking for. I think it's all sort of mixed in there together. I think it's, it's their experience of the risen Jesus in worship. I think it is also as they, uh, it, when you think about what the early Christians experienced, uh, it had to be traumatic. And most of us who've had a traumatic experience are at some point driven back into Scripture if we have been right, raised in that tradition. And the Jews were that. So they, 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 were, they were rushed back into what has gone on, what has happened among us. And some of that, I mean, Luke 24 tells us that Jesus himself appears and takes them through the Scriptures and shows them these things. I think that there's a critical period in which but between their, their conviction that Jesus has conquered death and their religious experiences of him, combined with that ongoing rereading of text, and, and they discover in there things. 
Exactly when that happened, I, I don't know we can say. What I can say with full certainty is that the earliest writing theologian had been there a long time with a divine Christ. That it, Paul doesn't start with a, a kind of a low Christology and then end up later on. I, th I think if, if Martin Hingle is right, and I think he is, that within five years of, of the execution of Jesus, Paul is converted, if not sooner. All of the, chur the church had already traversed that territory. And that Paul, Paul is accepting and passing on this notion of a divine Christ. Does that, 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 right, that, that, that's, that help? That's helpful. What came to my mind was the book of Revelation hmm. and the unwillingness of the church to say that Caesar was Lord. Yes. Because their concept of Jesus as Lord was so lofty that nobody else could pass that ceiling, as it were. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit about that tomorrow and sort of the, the notion that the, the claim that Jesus is Lord is counter-empirical language. Counter-imperial language, not empirical, but counter-imperial language. I think that's exactly right. And, but I think that, that even a Jew could say that. I mean, a Jew could not call Caesar Lord. The Shema wouldn't let them. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. There's, there's one Lord. So even, even a just, just a Jew, not necessarily a Christian Jew, could not buy into the notion that Caesar is Lord. There's a passage in Josephus where he, where he makes the statement about the language of Lord, something like kurios was not available for a Jew because of how close that word kurios was to the divine name. It's in Antiquities 2, I think. So there's already, the Jews have already reached that counter-imperial stance over against the emperor. And so I think Paul and early Christianity just nudges that on a little bit. And a bit. But I, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that tomorrow evening. I, I don't think that it's the counter-imperialism that creates this dynamic, though. I think it was already there in Judaism. Yeah, thank you. Everybody's convinced, I'm sure. Well, but, uh, yeah, I think that goes without saying. <laughs> uh, Danny. You got me convinced. Um, I was wondering about Kurios as a title as opposed to a name Yes. in Paul. Right. Because we have instances later where it seems to be treated as a nominus sacra. It's shortened in the, yeah. in the transmission. And right. it's translating a name. Yes. So what... Well, and, 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 and w w on the third night, <laughs> I'm kind of, you're, you're previewing a little bit. The, the question is, in the Septuagint, you have the divine name, the Yod, the He, the Vav, the He. When you see the word kurios, is that a translation or is it a substitute word? What we do know is that Jews reading the, 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 the text, when they, in Hebrew, when they got to it, they didn't say Yahweh, they said Adonai. And the reason we know that is because we have rabbis that discuss that. And uh, in, in the temple, there's a statement in the Mishnah that says, in the temple, it's okay occasionally to use the word Yahweh, but not in the diaspora. Has, you must be near the temple or near the temple to use that word. So we already know. So the question is, is Kurios a name or is it a title? It clearly translates the divine name. And it's associated with Jesus, but is it a representation of that? And, and it, it's, it's difficult to say. Is Kurios the name? Or is um, Kurios representing the name? Standing for the name. A name that was not to be spoken. Remember, there are blasphemy laws. To speak the name was a capital offense, according to the mission of St. Andrew. Um, so you were very careful in using the name. I have used it cavalierly tonight, the name Yahweh, over and over again. Um, my, my best friend's a rabbi, the one that does the radio show with me, and uh, he cringes when I use the word. Um, Jews today will not write the word God, G-O-D. They will say G hyphen D, out of reverence for the name. So, it's a great question. I'm not sure how to answer it to say, is Kurios a name or is it representing a name? And it's become so closely connected that to say the name is to say Kurios is to say the same as the name. That's sort of how I understand it. Is it a representation? Is it a substitute? Is it a circumlocution of the divine name? 
It's interesting to watch, see what happens with the divine name. We'll, we'll have fun with uh, some of the Dead Sea Scrolls when we see them. Yes, sir. Well, not, not so much a, a question, but more of a comment. As, as you were reading uh, that long quote from Bousset, uh, scripture came immediately to my mind, John 20, 28, mm. when Thomas exclaims, my Lord and my God. That's definitely uh, a, a title. Uh, yeah. You know, Thomas is, and, and I know that's Johannine, and, and, right. uh, and we're thinking eyewitness testimony, and this is an eyewitness story, and it's more of a reaction uh, yeah. than a question. Right. Anyway. Yeah, that, yeah, that's a great, great text where, where clearly for Thomas, I hate calling him Doubting Thomas because he, that, that's a pretty bad rap, frankly, but uh, when Thomas comes to that moment of confession, and, and Jesus said to him, blessed are you, you know, or, or blessed are all of those who will never see me and yet make that same confession. Yeah. You have a question? Dr. Trites, go ahead. Uh, surely Luke uh, in Acts, hmm. when he represents Paul's conversion, yes. uh, has the question, who are you, Lord? Who are you, Lord, so right? He's yeah. confronted with the Lordship. At that Christ. very moment, yeah. And I, whether, whether, whether Paul was meaning Lord in the fullest sense of divinity yet, yeah, we don't know. I mean, it's, it's clearly an address as evocative form, Kyrie. Um, but it's certainly suggestive, isn't it? Who are you, Lord, that I'm persecuting? So I think, in, particularly in the Gospels, when you see the word Kyrios, it isn't always in the fullest sense of divinity but the fact that opponents never refer to Jesus as Kyrios, they call him teacher, they call him rabbi, but they never call him Kyrios. It's only the followers of Jesus who call him that because I think they're moving toward that realization of who Jesus is. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus, Jesus is rabbi, he's prophet, he's Messiah, and then he's Lord. And that, that dawning comes upon him fully and completely at the resurrection. This is Paul, at least in Romans 1, 3, and 4. The dawning, the full flower of what was happening with Jesus happens at the resurrection. And so after that, that's why Thomas can say, my Lord and my God, at that point. Yeah, thanks. That's a great... Thank you. Paul and X. You know, in some of the scrolls, you'll get um, ordinary Hebrew script for that period of time, first century B.C. And then when you come to Yahweh, the Tetragrammaton, they will use either a archaic script and Dr. Cape showed you pictures of that, or, or four dots. They don't even bother writing letters. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Glenn. Yeah, Glenn. Um, my question relates to Bousset okay. and the context in which he was doing his work. Mm. Um, my mind may have wandered. I was doing some searches on Curios and the like while you were talking, uh, but you... I don't recall you saying a whole lot about the anti-Semitic context in which he worked, and yeah. some of that being the driving force for it having to be Hellenistic, etc., as opposed to Judaism. Yeah, yeah, Un yeah. I, uh, in a fuller version of this, I, I, I get into that. Unfortunately, uh, we're talking about Germany. We're talking from about the late 1800s. Many German scholars. There's an anti-Semitic ring. Christianity was a sublime religion. Judaism was not so good. So how, so how could this sublime religion come from this not so good people, right? The Jews were already being viewed as suspect. And so that they, they had to create a sort of a, a disconnect. Or there, for, for them, there was a disconnect already. And I think a lot of that is the anti-Semitism that we see that, that's building. A good religion like Christianity could not come from a bad religion. I sort of alluded to it when, when his judgment was that the nadir, the, the low point of Judaism came right before the birth of Jesus. And so that's why it needed to be sort of corrected and ratcheted up. So spate Judentum, late Judaism, um, was a religion that had lost its way. It has lost its focus. It had become something unpleasant, completely unpleasant, un, uh, unlike its, its origin. And particularly unlike, they loved the prophets. They loved Amos and, and, and Isaiah, first Isaiah particularly. They loved that period. They thought that's when Judaism would have its most robust and powerful religion. So, but yeah, it was, it was an anti-Semitism. Susan Marchand has written about that, I think. And uh, 
Some others have as well. Uh, Susanna Heschel as well, the, the daughter of uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel, or is it granddaughter? I don't know. Yeah, has written about that as well. Um, that this sort of anti-Judaism, this anti-Semitism funded intellectually this dismissive attitude toward Judaism. And it took the Holocaust and it took the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls and pseudepigrapha and the like to reset and to get us back on track for understanding, really uh, having a better sense of what Second Temple Judaism was about. And people like Alan Siegel have had a much more generous view of that in, in, in Craig's work and some of the work of the people I cited as well. W.D. Davies, Ed Sanders, and others. So it, it might be helpful for the audience to also understand that German scholars are very critical of that period. Modern, jar, modern, modern German scholars. scholars, yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I, my, Thank you. I'll add a footnote. Uh, the lowest point was reached in of this uh, anti-Semitic scholarship in Germany in 1940 when a book on Jesus came out. I won't mention the author's name, but uh, he's mm -hmm. famously remembered for having said, Jesus war kein Jude. Jesus was not a Jew. Mm -hmm. Like what? Mm. You know, yeah. that, that, that almost has a, it's a skinhead theology. That's weird. Yeah, exactly. Somebody else. Was there a yeah. hand over here? Uh, yes, yeah. Dr. Gardner. Thanks, Dr. Gardner. Thanks. I'm thinking in particular of perhaps practical theology in terms mm. of your teaching. And I'm thinking in particular of the doctrine of the Trinity, mm. how what your, your uh, teaching how that contributes to um, positively to our understanding of Trinity, the name. Right. right. And also, um, there have been a number of movements away from what we would call um, Orthodox Christianity and recently the whole Jehovah's Witness movement mm -hmm. around the name of Jesus as, you know, as Lord, as the Son, as a member of the Trinity. I'm wondering, in your work, have you... Um, what would you offer to us in terms of the work that you've done in terms of um, helping us to have a better appreciation of Trinity? Yeah, thank you. Uh, a lot of this has been born in me um, through the interfaith dialogue that I'm engaged in. Um, my Jewish best friend will say that, that uh, Christians are polytheists, only Islam and Judaism are true monotheistic religions. Um, a proper understanding of Jesus is at the heart of what separates us from Judaism and from Islam. I mean, Islam has a very high view of Jesus. If you've ever studied and read the Quran, Islam, you know, Jesus is virgin born. He's the Messiah. Uh, he's coming again. Um, but he's not the son of God. And he's not divine in any sense. And if you say he is, you're an infidel, sort of, this kind of thing. So it's... Um, the person of Jesus is at the, the heart of what separates us as Christians from every other group out there. What we do with Jesus is very unique. And it, it is, uh, what we find in Paul is, I think, a, the, the, the raw, uh, the, 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 the natural resources needed for building what becomes later Trinitarian theology. In, the Shema, in Paul's version of the Shema, what I call the recalibrated Shema, he says, for us Christians, there is one God the Father from whom, source of all things, and to whom we are, we are going. And then there is one Lord Jesus Christ through whom all things were made and through whom we've been redeemed. That's essentially what I think he's saying. That's a, a revised version of the Shema. That, that I, I think it's binatarian, there's no mention of the Spirit. But there are places in Paul where what we find is, for example, the ending of 2 Corinthians and, and places in Romans nine and uh, Romans 8 and 9 are places where I think the Spirit is, is there as well. Though Paul is, is not ever giving us a full-blown Trinitarian theology. He is giving us the raw materials out of which that will be built in later years. Um, my students find that troubling. They want to find Trinity, you know, in that. Um, but I do think it is essential to who we are. I'm a Baptist minister, and um, it's not uncommon for me to go preaching somewhere. And I'm often corrected uh, when I'm, I'm preaching. Uh, actually, when I'm praying, I'm corrected. Because I will often in my prayers, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. 
It's kind of a Celtic thing for me. Uh, but it's, 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 a, it's a spirituality, I think, that, that really brings out the notion of Trinity and that we, don't, we, we, must not, uh, we, we must not lose that. We must not compromise that. That Jesus being, uh, and Richard Baucom uses this language, that Jesus is being included within the divine identity. There is one God, and Jesus and spirit are included in that divine identity. And that's how we're to understand it. He's trying to wrestle with some of the same language issues that I am and others. How is it that Jesus is so closely associated with God in such a way that he bears his name, he bears his dignity, he, he bears um, the weight of what God is promised to be doing in the future so, so that when, when Jesus comes, or when the promise of the, the Messiah comes, we see in Jesus that God has been made flesh, the Johannine language. Paul never says anything quite like that. But he says some things similar to that. Yeah. I think it's really incredible, really important that we hold on to that. Uh, anyone else? We have a few more minutes. <coughs> Dr. Clackey, go ahead. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I understand the uh, background to almost the kind of Hellenistic um, conception of lordship coming all the way even backwards to sort of Herodotus and so on. But to what extent do you think that the arrival of the Spirit at Pentecost influenced an enlightenment of believers' hearts in terms of their understanding of Christ now as Lord? Yeah, I, I think I'm going, going back to what I, and perhaps I didn't, I wasn't, Clear enough, but but their their experience in worship as they gather is an experience of the spirit, spirit endowed utterances coming from prophets in Paul's churches, um, spirit charisma there, and I do think that this for, that Paul would understand that that the work of the spirit is 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 a central part of what is becoming the, the church, and uh, that the spirit's activity is part of what drives the inspired, inspired the exegesis of the rereading the text. So when they are rereading text and they're finding Jesus in that text, that is a spirit-endowed, spirit-directed event. And I think Paul would have seen it that way. So it's their gatherings together that are spirit-led, spirit-blessed, spirit-guided, but it's also their reworking through these texts and finding Jesus in places finding prophecies where there were no prophecies, right? Uh, finding hints and, and magical. I know Danny's working on some interesting work uh, in, in, Dave, in Matthew on that. But um, f finding in the scriptures this story, uh, hints of that. So Paul can say that Christ died um, for our sins in accordance with the scriptures and that he was buried and he was raised in accordance with the scriptures. Well, what scriptures in what way? I think Paul would have located that as the work of the Spirit in teasing that out, um, helping the church figure that piece out. We have another question right here next to Dr. Gardner. Yeah. Uh, I suppose this question comes back a little bit to your, maybe your interfaith dialogue around hmm. um, the Shema and what it means to say that the Lord is one. Mm -hmm. um, do you understand um, that word one as meaning sort of numerical accounting? <laughs> yeah. Or something different yeah. than that? Because I think Larry Hurtado has a little bit of a, um, the way he accounts for it. Uh, the, I guess my question, uh, maybe it's coming into Trinitarian theology again a little bit here, but um, are we, are we, uh, do you understand monotheism in the same way? I know that you don't understand it the same way. Sorry, this is not a great question. <laughs> no, but, you, but, uh, but you're circling. Do you know what you're I'm going to you know land in a moment. You know what yeah. I'm leaning into here? Yeah. What I'm leaning yeah. into sure. is um, we are monotheists. Okay. Talk about uh, Christians now. Like Christians right, okay, now yes. are monotheists. We believe in one God. Yes. Um, to what extent would you describe the Shema as, and Jesus' repetition of the Shema in particular, um, you know, uh, in, say, Mark 12, as um, 
do you understand that differently in your interfaith dialogue than your friends do? Yeah, I, I, what, I, what I think happens is that, uh, is the, I think a part of the question, is the monotheism that we have represented in Paul an exclusive monotheism, or is it inclusive? Is, or is there fluidity there? And I really think the more I look at the at evidence, and this is part of my engagement with l the work of, um, of Alan Siegel, this, the Jewish, late, great Alan Siegel, who, a Jewish New Testament scholar who wrote a wonderful book called Two Powers in Heaven. And I think a hardening comes upon the heart of Jews in the post-New Testament period because they're reacting against Christians, they're reacting against Gnostics. So the categories of monotheism, yes, there's one God. The word one there could be translated, the Lord alone, Yahweh alone is our God. Understanding, you know, that, that, other, that there are other so-called gods out there, other so-called lords out there. Not, not giving them any credentials, but saying that we are a people for whom Yahweh is our, our God, Eloheinu, our God. Yahweh alone is ours. So the question is, and I don't think monotheism is some sort of theoretical, mathematical thing. When you look at monotheism, look at what people did, not what they believed. How, what did they do? Well, they were, you know, they worshipped one God. They went to their deaths saying, we will not eat pork because the one God has told us not to. It, this, these, this was a robust faith. It wasn't a, some theoretical, analytical thinking of God is one, well, one is not equal to two. And I don't think they, they did went through those machinations. We might, kind of in a post-enlightenment culture, but I don't think that was their issue. That's our issue. W what we find Paul doing, though, is we find that Paul, Paul's disposition toward Jesus and Paul relating to Jesus in the same way a monotheist would relate to God using the same language, the same reverencing, the same disposition of heart. And so that's why I think we can say with full confidence that when Paul says Jesus is curious, he doesn't mean he's our teacher. It means that he is identified in some strategic sense, in some important sense, with the one true God. And that, that, that to, to see Jesus, to see Jesus, is to, or to see the face of Jesus in, in 2 Corinthians 4, is to see the, the glory and experience the glory of God. Glory, of course, in the full sense of the Shekinah. At that point. So I don't know. I don't know if that helps at all. I, I, I do think we've got to abandon. Some people say we've got to get rid of monotheism altogether. The word mon is a bad word. Get rid of it. Yeah, if, if, it, if we're going to insist that we understand it in some analytical, mathematical way, yeah, let's get rid of it. But if we try to understand it in the Jewish sense, Second Temple Jewish sense, when it was, it was, these are fighting words. We're willing, we're, we're not willing to say Caesar is Lord because there is one Lord and we are under that Lord. He is our God and we don't, we don't bow to another. Look at the book of Daniel. Look at how Daniel responded to the polytheism there. That's monotheism. That's not some analytical, mathematical issue. So, I don't know if that helps or not. Good questions, though. I don't see any more hands, and uh, it's just a few minutes before nine, and we have a reception, so I think mm -hmm. I will call it in to the evening session, and let's conclude with a round of applause for our speaker. Thank you.